This is the last interview given by Lyndon Baines Johnson, 36th President of the United States. It was held 10 days before his death at the LBJ Ranch in Texas. The subject was one dear to Mr. Johnson, a towering achievement of his administration, the struggle for civil rights. A lot of people say if you hadn't had all this civil rights legislation, we never had this problem. We'd have had more than we could even dream of if we hadn't had. If we've had them with it, you can imagine what we'd have had if we had continued to sit on that dynamite keg. A month before, the president had come to the LBJ Library at the University of Texas in Austin to greet civil rights leaders, black and white, from all over the country. The library held a symposium to mark the opening of the president's civil rights papers. Of the 31 million Johnson papers housed here, one million deal with civil rights. In the library, Lyndon Johnson's three legislative milestones in civil rights. 1964, the act which prohibited discrimination in public accommodations and strengthened school desegregation and fair employment. 1965, voting rights gave the federal government the power to enforce laws, giving minorities the most precious right, the right to vote. 1968, housing, prohibited discrimination in the sale or rental of most housing in the United States. Three acts and a surge in the civil rights movement unparalleled since Reconstruction. There were new faces and there were old faces too. Former Chief Justice of the United States, Earl Warren. Former Vice President, Senator Hubert Humphrey. Roy Wilkins, Chief Executive Justice Director, NAACP. Of all people in this and country. two newly elected uh, Congresswomen the, from California, the, Yvonne the, Brathwaite Burke, among the people. And, and from Texas, Barbara Jordan. Games, the President had braved a Texas ice storm to be here, and he stayed through the long day and evening. The next day, a threatened disruption. Some black factions demanded time to speak, claiming the meeting was unrepresentative. The president gave them permission to speak. Roy Innes, director of CORE, was given five minutes. Chairman. He was joined by the Reverend A. Kendall Smith, New York Roy City Council of Churches Task Force on Racism. The president told me later both men had received invitations to attend the symposium. New York Task Force on Racism. Then Clarence Mitchell, Washington director and AACP, rose to his feet. President, drawn and fatigued, came back to the rostrum. The disruption was over. A month to the day later, the president spoke with me. This hour is the last interview with the 36th president of the United States. I never thought that I would uh, awaken and find myself in the position of power that a president has. But I, I am here, and I have it, and I'm going to use it uh, to try to con correct what I know and genuinely believe are uh, injustices toward my fellow man. And uh, I didn't do as much as I wanted to do, but uh, I did more than uh, uh, had been done up to that time.
Mr. President, at the recent Civil Rights Symposium at Austin, when your civil rights papers were open, uh, you made uh, a lot of interesting statements, but one in particular I'd like to mention here now. You said, I do not want to say that I've always seen this matter in terms of the special plight of the black man as clearly as I came to see it in the course of my life and experience and responsibility. How did you come to see it at some point? What, what, what was the moment of revelation? I don't know that I can pinpoint a day or time or an hour. I think that we're all the products uh, of our environment. And here on the Perdinalis, uh, we uh, did not grow up in any prejudiced atmosphere. This area is populated uh, by Germans who immigrated here 100 years ago. We have few, if any, black citizens. Although when I was a child, three or four years old, I grew up with Mexican-Americans and they were my playmates. But like most other citizens uh, of this country, uh, I took my own rights for granted and uh, I did not uh, uh, see and feel and was not as concerned with my fellow man as I later became, as my service uh, extended itself and as I became more acquainted with the problems uh, of the land. When I was a young man, I taught in a Mexican-American school. And uh, there I got my real deep first impressions uh, of the prejudices that existed and the inequity of our school system between whites and browns. Uh, later, I was an NYA administrator and dealt with the poverty groups Many young people uh, in the NYA were blacks and browns, and I saw the inequalities of our system then. Later, as a young congressman, uh, when I was a candidate, and uh, I would go campaigning in my district, uh, when I finished my speech, all the people come through, shake hands with me. The whites would come through first, the blacks would stand aside waiting their turn, and uh, I remember on occasion or two, uh, I was criticized severely for asking the blacks to come through and shake hands with them. Uh, they felt that I was uh, extending to them a, a privilege that uh, they shouldn't have. Uh, very few were voting in Texas in those days because we had a poll tax that uh, uh, helped to disenfranchise them and uh, they were not encouraged to vote. But as they participated in the elections and I uh, uh, saw their problems and got to know them through my work and teaching and my early years in Congress. I, I think I gradually took on a, 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 a different viewpoint. As Vice President, uh, uh, dealing with the cause of the minorities and trying to uh, uh, evaluate their problems and find a solution to, me, to them, uh, uh, no doubt uh, gave me a breadth of uh, understanding and vision I hadn't had before. And finally, when I became president and realized that uh, I was the leader of the country and that there were, I was the president of all the people and uh, all the people were looking to me to correct the inequalities and inequities and injustices and there was something that I could do about it uh, I concluded that uh, I, now that I have the power, I'm going to use it every way I could. And of course, uh, uh, most of my efforts uh, that brought fruit were during the time when I had the power of the presidency behind me. By 1937, you had been elected to Congress. Uh, did it, uh, was it difficult for you to reconcile the, the problem of uh, representing a constituency in Texas with uh, the need, to, your, your, your new felt need to uh, take a stand on civil rights? First, I didn't have the power to do much about it as an individual congressman of 435, but I did not enthusiastically exercise uh, the power I did have because, uh, 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 first of all, uh, I couldn't have done much about it. And second of all, I was not aware of the extent of the overall injustices. 
that was practiced upon him as a young congressman that I later realized as a leader of the nation in the Senate and as vice president and president. At Gettysburg in 1963, when still vice president, you said this. Until justice is blind to color, until all education is unaware of race, until opportunity is unconcerned with the color of men's skins, emancipation will be a proclamation, but emancipation will not be a fact. Wasn't that just about as strong a statement as you'd ever made up to that point? Perhaps. I think that's still true. I thought it was very true then. We've made a lot of progress, but we haven't made near enough. And education is not blind to color in this uh, country. And uh, justice is not unaware of race. And uh, it'll take us decades to uh, try to uh, bring the white man, the black man, the brown man on equal footing in all of these fields. But there's no question but what uh, a great many people felt that when we had the Emancipation Proclamation, we had made great steps forward, and we had. Uh, but, uh, but we had not solved our problems, and a hundred years went by, and uh, we'd done very little about it. Now, we have had a rapid advancement in the period of the 60s, and I hope we'll have in the 70s. Uh, but uh, I believe that's a strong statement. I intend it to be strong, but I think it's an accurate statement. You wrote in your book, uh, The Vantage Point, that uh, about that moment when you became president of the United States, and truly the top leader of all the people, and you said, just when the blacks had their hopes for equality and justice raised, after centuries of misery and despair, they awoke one morning to discover their future in the hands of a president born in the South. Well, do you think they really felt that way after all you'd been doing in the uh, almost 10 years previously, uh, at least the last six years previously? Since yes, yes, I'm sure that, uh, uh, that they have a feeling toward uh, uh, a Southerner, and they have doubts. They had them then, and I think they have them now. And they may be justified in some regards because uh, I was the product of an environment in an area that was, uh, had never been particularly aggressive in uh, ridding them of uh, some of these injustices perpetrated upon them. And I can understand their viewpoint, although uh, I have no complaint about the treatment of me as president. Uh, I frequently disagreed with the methods and the procedure and the manner that we went about things. And we had our differences with Mr. Wilkins and Mr. Young, Dr. King, and others on what decision I ought to make, certainly on the war uh, and things of that nature. But they were respectful and they were reasoning and they were fair with me. And uh, any leadership I provided to make advancements in their field, they supported and, and effectively supported it. Well, in 64, of course, that was... Uh the year of the great filibuster that you finally had to break, going against uh, your own feelings, as you've told us earlier in this talk, or for unlimited debate. What brought you to that decision that you finally communicated then to Senator Russell that this time there would be no compromise? <clears throat> well, uh, Senator Russell, I think, understood that from the day I became president. Uh, I recall Senator Russell made a speech early in my presidency that was somewhat prophetic. He said he felt, he knew that I felt certain things deeply and he expected me to move in certain areas and then when I moved, I would move with all the power that I had and put all my chips in and they had to be prepared to uh, resist that effort. And uh, that's, what, uh, that's what we did in the 64 Act. After 64, just a year later, you put your full weight uh, behind another historic measure, and that was the Voting Act uh, of 1965, Voting Rights Act of 1965, which provided direct federal action in order to help the blacks register and vote. 
Uh, could you start from the beginning and tell us about the evolution of, of that act and getting it through just a year after the 64 victory? I think it was a part of a philosophy that I had of the presidency. I wasn't sure that I would run for re-election 64. When I decided I would run and did run and was elected, I realized that uh, a president's time is limited, regardless of how uh, big a mandate he may have received. So after the 64 election, I said to the people associated with me, we got to make up our mind what the big problems of this country are and do what we can about them in cooperation with the Congress and get that legislation through in a period of relatively few months because as things go on, we won't have uh, the support of the country that we have in November 64. Uh, Voting Rights Act was one of the things that needed to uh, do it. Poverty and health and Medicaid and all those things that made up a part of the program. And I called down the congressional leadership and said, uh, uh, we feel that uh, we ought to have this legislation, that now is the time that we can pass it, and uh, I want to review it with you, explain it all to you, ask for your help and cooperation, and uh, if you feel that uh, you want to invite me to come to the Congress to deliver this message in person, I'll do it. If you don't, I will send it up by message. The uh, uh, leadership discussed it thoroughly and uh, extended me an invitation. And I went there and uh, uh, sometime in March, as I recall. Every American citizen must have an equal right to vote. There is no reason which can excuse the denial of that right. There is no duty which weighs more heavily on us than the duty we have to ensure that right. And uh, over the evolution of three or four months, uh, we were able to get that rather strong bill passed in the House and in the Senate. Uh, Senator Durkin, as you know, uh, uh, supported us in the final days and made effective speeches and uh, voted for cloture. And uh, uh, we uh, put that to uh, landmark legislation on the statute books. I doubt that uh, we could have done that in 67, as, as uh, things went on and the divisions uh, came about. We hit while the iron was hot, and uh, we made uh, much progress. You think the divisions of the Vietnam War did bring a, a halt to the, any hope of consensus on these, dom on these domestic issues? No, no. Uh, a uh, great many of our better pieces of domestic legislation were the product of the Congress of 1968. Uh, and uh, 68 was one of our more productive years. Uh, I was given everything I asked for in Vietnam in the way of men, in the way of authority, uh, in the way of appropriations. And uh, it was anguish for all of us. The people that uh, uh, felt that what I was doing was not right, uh, they suffered. Uh, to have to criticize me and to find fault with what we were doing. And I suffered to have to listen to them and uh, try to find a better course and never to really find the right answer. We had many, many disappointments. Uh, but uh, I never liked authority and I never liked appropriations and I never liked a majority support in either house or I felt uh, in the country of uh, my programs. and. I think a president uh, must have those things if he's going to be a good president. He can't have a Congress going one direction and the judiciary another and the executive another. It's just like the pilot of a plane going this way and the co-pilot going this way. And I never had that problem, and I'm grateful for it. I'd like to ask you about Selma, uh, the march organized by Martin Luther 
King from Selma to Montgomery protesting uh, how difficult it was for blacks to vote at that period. Uh, in the middle of the crisis in Selma, you went on television. Your staff, uh, we gather, advised against it. And the result was that we shall overcome speech uh, uh, to the Congress. What happened in Selma is part of a far larger movement which reaches into every section and state of America. It is the effort of American Negroes to secure for themselves the full blessings of American life. Their cause must be our cause too. Because it's not just Negroes, but really it's all of us who must overcome the crippling legacy of bigotry and injustice, and we shall overcome. Uh, what was the reaction of that, uh, to that speech? This, this moved you really in, into the camp with the protesters. Uh, I think that uh, when a president exercises leadership, that he believes he must exercise, that he feels is necessary for the country, that uh, he uh, looks at his people and tells them this is the course of action that is just and fair and this is what I'm going to do, I think the reaction is generally good, and it was then. And of course, uh, uh, I was not without criticism from many sources in many places, but uh, I'm glad I did what I did, and I think it was was helpful to the course that we pursued and the laws we enacted subsequently. Could you tell us about the decisions that went in to the appointment of the first Negro ever to the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, Thurgood Marshall? Yes, uh, I had met uh, uh, Justice Marshall when he was a lawyer for the NAACP, and I had not had an intimate relationship, but I knew him when I became president. He was on the federal bench in New York. I looked over the country to, uh, in, uh, to attempt to find uh, a person to be Solicitor General who would argue the cases before the Supreme Court. I also knew that there had never been a black on the Supreme Court in this country, there never been a black in the cabinet of this country. And uh, I didn't feel that was just. And I sent for him and told him, if you resign the federal judgeship, uh, you give up a lifetime job. The job I'm offering you is a temporary job. If I'm, uh, if some, something happens to me, uh, you'll be out of a job the next morning. Another administration will be out of a job. But I would like for you to be my Solicitor General if you feel that you can uh, be available for that assignment. He said, yes, Mr. President, I am available. I'll resign and I'll be ready whenever you asked me. He came there and he discharged his duty as Solicitor General well. I never mentioned the Supreme Court to him. Uh, when it became possible for me to point him on the Supreme Court, I called him and asked him to come to my office quietly uh, the next day and to tell no one. I wanted to counsel with him on a matter. And uh, he courteously agreed to be there at 10 o'clock. Uh, whatever time I set the appointment, he came in and uh, sat down and I told him that uh, I had this problem of selecting a man to Supreme Court and that I had had him in mind and I said I'm going to send your nomination to the Senate if uh, it's agreeable to you. And he said yes it was. He said you told me not to say anything about this to anyone and uh, uh, said that before you do I think I'll tell you something and my heart almost stopped beating because I was afraid it was going to be some problem of some kind. But he said, you, you told me not to discuss this with anyone else, this conference, but said, I just couldn't contain myself. I had to tell my wife. When a president calls up and asks to see a man, he just can't be expected to keep that from everyone. And I had to tell her and said, now that uh, you've uh, given me this great honor, could I be excused long enough to just call her? and tell her that uh, uh, what has happened. And I asked that they get Ms. Marshall on the phone, the White House operator got her on the phone, and I asked him to pick it up. And uh, uh, he said,
said hello and uh, be sure that Ms. Marshall's on the other end. And she said, uh, honey, did we make it? <laughs> and uh, all the feeling uh, that I thought I had contained must have been present there all those years, and they must have at least had the silent hope uh, that uh, if any black ever made the Supreme Court, he would make it. And I've always uh, uh, felt uh, very warm to toward Ms. Marshall because I, I, I think that uh, Lady Bird must have felt that way many times in critical crisis that I was confronted with. She would say, uh, honey, did we make it? And uh, there was a team, but uh, the pride that really came to me was here was a qualified man who had done so much for his people and so much for his country that finally on the basis of merit uh, could be nominated and confirmed by the Senate. And that last is not an easy job uh, uh, for any man that's nominated for the Supreme Court. In 1965, in an in a eloquent speech at Howard University, you apparently took a new tack. You said, But freedom is not enough. You do not wipe away the scars of centuries by saying now, you are free to go where you want and do as you desire and choose the leaders you please. You do not take a person who for years has been hobbled by chains and liberate him. Thus, it is not enough just to open the gates of opportunity. All our citizens must have the ability to walk through those gates. Uh, how did you come to uh, believe that the country was ready for that new move forward in the civil rights approach. The country said that we want you to vote, or we want you to eat any place you want to, and we want you to sleep any place, any public establishment if you want to. Uh, we want you to have uh, equality in jobs, and in many ways, uh, we improved our education, health, and welfare systems where uh, more equal justice was being dispensed. But uh, all those things don't do any good. It doesn't do any good to have a job if you're not qualified to hold it. It doesn't do you any good to have the right to build a house if you don't have the money to build it. It doesn't do you any right to have the right to go into the Hilton Hotel in New York if you haven't got the money to pay the rent on the building. All of those things are not worth much to you unless you uh, have uh, the economic resources and the preparation. Mr. President, the statement is frequently made about that period in our national history, indeed going right up to today, is that perhaps in your zeal to do something for the blacks of this country and, and the other underprivileged, uh, you had promised so much and the delivery was difficult. Do you think that you overpromised? No, I don't think. I, I don't know what we promised. We had certain goals, and we made certain recommendations, and we asked the Congress to do certain things. Uh, but uh, I'm unaware of a lot of promises that we made that were not fulfilled. Well, I think that uh, when we speak of promises, not specifically. Uh, political or legislative promises, but the promise of a better life, and that perhaps they believed that this was going to come with the passage of legislation and not over a longer period of time. Practically, the entire substance of the Johnson administration was uh, organized and prepared and recommended more than 20 years before by another president. Uh, Lyndon Johnson was not the first president to recommend federal aid to education. Uh, Harry Truman had a group that studied it, and Harry Truman asked the Congress to give him educational legislation. Lyndon Johnson was not the man to recommend Medicare. 
Harry Truman recommended Medicare and was called a socialist and a communist and everything else. So uh, in this country, uh, long before Lyndon Johnson came into a position of power, our leaders were recommending uh, great advances in the field of civil rights and great advances in the field of health and education and environment and consumer legislation uh, and space and things of that nature. Uh, I just happened to be the catalyst and happened to be there at the time and with the support and with the approval of uh, nearly everyone in the country that put them on the statute books. We passed 440 major pieces of legislation in the six years. Uh, and a great many people did say that we went too far and we went too fast. And well, we might have. Uh, but uh, the country was long overdue. We'd had a good many administrations where they uh, hadn't been able to achieve these things. But in this country, we always, uh, uh, it seems, uh, uh, is a long lapse between the time something's proposed and something's disposed. Well, now, in your book, uh, you say that the Democrats lost in 68 because they had gone too far and too fast. And the blue-collar worker felt that the Democratic Party had traded his welfare for the welfare of the black man. Well, I intend, uh, I, I don't really think it, uh, that we lost in 68 for any one single reason. Uh, uh, the blue-collar worker thinking that the black man had, I think all of those were uh, 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 dissatisfactions that we had in the populace. I don't think you can take any one thing and point to what makes a, a uh, man president by a change of 250,000 votes out of many millions. But I think that the Democratic uh, candidate uh, had dissatisfaction in those fields. Do you think that the, uh, that the blue collar Along worker has... Do <laughs> you think the blue collar worker has been lost to the Democrats, though, because of this uh, pressure no, for... No, I think the blue collar worker, all the workers are the backbone of the Democratic Party. And, uh, Times uh, they get disgruntled, dissatisfied with high prices and not quite as high rise in wages and things of that kind. And they express themselves and they have a right to and ought to. Now, we've touched on all of the bills or most of them in the civil rights area except the last one, which touches most directly on this matter of blue collar worker resentment, perhaps. And that's housing. In 66 and 67, we introduced a bill for non discrimination in rental and sale of housing. It was defeated. He brought it back and again in 68, and again, I gather, you didn't think that there was very much support for it, but it was something you had to do. With all the evidence pointing the other way, after two defeats, and now as a lame duck president, you said you weren't going to run again. Why did you think you were going to be able to get it through that time? Well, I, I wasn't too sure. Uh, the meeting we had with the blacks, they wanted me to issue an executive order and proclaim this by presidential edict. I didn't think it would uh, be very effective if the Congress uh, had not legislated. And I didn't want to uh, be a Hitler and start running the government by executive order. And I took the position that it wouldn't be wise to do it by executive order. It would arouse uh, the uh, antagonism of the Congress and the leadership of the people, and it wouldn't be followed. Difficult enough to follow it if you have the law of the land. And most of the leaders felt that uh, uh, they couldn't get the law, and they'd like to get uh, part of a loaf by executive order, get what they could. Uh, one of those leaders, agreed with me that we ought to go the legislative route. And that was Clarence Mitchell, and he stood up and said that if I would recommend it to the Congress and support it, that uh, he thought that was a route we should follow. And anyway, that was a route that I was determined to follow, so I made the recommendation, and we passed the Equal Housing Act of 68 after I'd announced that I would not accept the nomination. At the recent symposium, Barbara Jordan, uh, the newly elected congresswoman from Houston, uh, whom you, of course, know very well, said that the South would ultimately be more open to racial justice in the North. Uh, do you believe that? 
I, th I think it's a problem for all of America that uh, knows no region. I don't think prejudice is a matter of geography. I think we have it everywhere, and we have ample quantities of it in degrees that uh, we ought to be ashamed of. Sometimes it's because of color, and sometimes it's because of literacy, and sometimes it's because of something you don't control at all. But uh, uh, we're living in a fast age, and all of us are rather impatient. And uh, more important, we're rather intolerant of uh, the opinions of our fellow man and his judgments and his conduct and his traditions and his way of life. And uh, America was supposed to be the happy hunting ground for people of all religions and all faiths that could live life according to the dictates of their own conscience and uh, their own choice as long as they didn't uh, basically interfere with the rights of another man. But to deny that there is prejudice in the country uh, just uh, uh, um, makes the wrong bigger because we know it's here and the quicker we get at it, just like getting at heart disease or cancer or anything else, the better off we'll be. And I think we're making a good progress. Mr. President, you said in that quite uh, lovely speech at the library, and I do believe uh, you have told me private that you were feeling poorly and uh, but you didn't feel you could let your friends leave that hall without saying a word to them. Uh, you did speak to them and you said some uh, quite eloquent things. One of them you said to be black in a white society is not to stand on level and equal ground. Is a phrase that just came to you at that moment or is that something that you've had as kind of a credo and uh, years. No, I think it's a, it's a fact. I think we assume that because uh, a lot of our documents say all men are created equal, stand side by side. Uh, we have kidded ourselves in believing that we uh, that's actually a fact, just like the Emancipation Proclamation is a proclamation, but it's not a fact, and it's not a fact that we stand on equal ground and stand side by side. One stands in an elevated position with all the advantages the country gives him, and the other one stands down in the rut, neglected and overlooked, and uh, enjoyed the uh, uh, second-rate uh, of facilities and housing and jobs and schools and health and everything else uh, during our entire uh, governmental existence. And we've begun to do something about it, but unless we recognize the fact that one's on the hill and the other's in the hollow, or one's on the mountain and the other's in the ditch, uh, we're not uh, evaluating it properly, and if we don't evaluate the problem properly, we can't solve the problem. This uh, second thing you said there that uh, was a little more pragmatic, perhaps, uh, involved the blacks and the present administration. You told them to go and see Mr. Nixon and to ask him to set aside an hour to talk, and they don't need to start off by saying he's terrible because he doesn't think he's terrible, let me put it. Uh, do, you, do you think that if they ask, they can get that time to, to talk to the president? Yes, I think so, although I'm not making the president's appointment. I have no authority to speak for him. I won't make that clear. I think that uh, it's just the wise thing for all of us to do who are interested. Uh, I think we ought to go to the leadership of the Congress and say to them, here is a big problem that represents a cancer on the society of this country, and we want to do something about it, and here's what we think ought to be done, one, two, three, and here's the, uh, the way to go about it. Here's the legislation. Uh, as they have done with the civil rights conferences in past years. And then I think if they don't have uh, uh, the, the answer that they think is fair and just, that they have a right to call the president's uh, 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 people and say, we would like to talk to some of you in the White House about this, get you evaluated, and if it can't be corrected, we want to go all the way to a higher appeal to the highest officer of the land, the president himself. I don't think you're going to be very effective if you say the Congress is no good and antiquated and ought to get out of the way, and the cabinet officer is dishonest and they won't do anything about it, and the president can't read and write and he's no good, uh, because uh, none of those people uh, 
Uh, you can't sell them that argument. They don't believe that. They, they think they are good and they're doing the best they can. They want to do what's right. And I found a lot of times that my viewpoint was uh, helped a great deal and that uh, I was strengthened in the decisions I made by what I learned by people who came to see me. And I wasn't always anxious to see all of them and sought to advice, but uh, I think it'd be helpful to both groups. And the president's a good listener. Uh, all of them haven't been. Some of them thought I didn't listen enough, but if they'd count the hours that I had people speak to me, uh, 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 I'm grateful for those hours. I learned from them. At the very end of that uh, speech here in Austin, I think uh, you repeated a memorable phrase that you'd used before in Congress in 65. We have proved that great progress is possible. We know how much still remains to be done. And if our efforts continue, and if our will is strong, and if our hearts are right, and if courage remains our constant companion, then, my fellow Americans, I am confident we shall overcome. Well, Mr. President, do you think that on this great, still unresolved issue of civil rights, we shall overcome? I certainly do. Thank you, Mr. President.